My name is Michael O'Neill, and I am with the Massachusetts LGBT Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we appreciate you coming, uh, taking the time to come out and join our Zoom webinar today on a resume writing and tips uh, with Fenway Health. Uh, the Massachusetts Chamber, the LGBT Chamber of Commerce, is a nonprofit organization that serves the entire state of Massachusetts uh, with the end goal of LGBTQ economic equality. Uh, one of our main sources of programming is our job fairs. We do three job fairs a year. January, June, and in the fall. Um, our fall one is coming up this following Monday, October 30th, from 3 to 6 p.m. in Northeastern. So if you aren't signed up, check out our events page on our website and our Facebook uh, to sign up and get more information on how to attend. We're going to have about 30 companies from our partnerships attending and looking to hire from the LGBTQ community, including our partners at Fenway Health, uh, who have been a uh, great participant in all of our job fairs, as well as our online job board, uh, really active in our work and a really great supporter of what we do. Uh, so we're really excited to have them here today to join us for our resume workshop. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Julia and we can get started. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Julia Cochran. I use the she series pronouns and I'm um, one of the human resources associates on the recruitment team at Fenway Health. And um, I'll let John also introduce himself as I get set sharing my screen. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everyone. My name is John Lowen. I use the he series pronouns. Uh, I lead the recruiting team here at Fenway Health. Uh, we're very excited to be able to present this with you, give you hopefully some good tips and, uh, and tricks when building out your resume and cover letters, uh, and also just uh, to get a little bit more about Fenway Health. So welcome. Awesome. Thanks, John. And can you see my screen? Like all, it's all good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So we just start introduction. So first we'll go over um, resumes and I'll go through some do's and don'ts for resumes. Um, just a little agenda slide. First, we'll go over some do's and don'ts for formatting your resumes. Then we can go over what to include and then what to actually write. Like what do you how do you write those things that you're including in your resume? So first in formatting, I can go over some some do's and then some don'ts. Um, the first thing is always make sure to use professional font when you're making your resume. Um, this just means either Times New Roman or something else that's pretty simple and easy to easy to read. The second is to make the formatting really easily readable and consistent. You really want um, your experiences to jump off the page and be really easy to read. And so someone can take a quick look at your resume and gather lots of information. Um, the next is to fill the entire page. Um, you don't want to have lots of blank spaces in your resume um, or like only fill half the page. And then also another tip is to generally limit your resume to one page. This could be different if you're applying to a higher level position and you have a lot more experience, but generally you should limit the information on your resume to one page. Um, the next is to include dates on all of your experiences. It's really important for employers to kind of get a picture of your past work history and then also to be able to line up those dates once they check your references afterwards. And then the last do for formatting your resume is to proofread. You should always proofread your resume. Um, you should read it through at least 10 times before you send it to anyone because you don't want there to be any mistakes or anything like that when it's pretty easily avoidable. And then for some don'ts for our formatting, um, don't use a font that's hard to read. So don't use like Comic Sans or any other font that's unprofessional or might be hard for somebody to read. And then you shouldn't make your resume extremely long or short. Like I had said, it should really take up all the space on the page. And you don't wanna have like half a page and you also don't wanna have like five pages of resume because no one's going to take the time to bother to read that. And then the last is don't use hanging bullets. This just means using complete sentences. This goes hand in hand with proofreading your resume. You wanna make sure that every sentence and every bullet point on your resume is a complete, is a complete sentence. 
Julia, we have our first question uh, awesome. in, in the chat here is, should mm -hmm. I include my pronouns on my resume? If so, where do I put them? Yeah, I think that including your pronouns on your resume, especially if you're applying to a company like Fenway Health or something like that, but I think including your pronouns on your resume is definitely a good move. And I think I mean, I would say like if you have your name right at the top of the, your resume, you could definitely include it like in parentheses afterwards or maybe right below your name or something like that. I don't think it has to be like super front and center. Your name should definitely be the biggest thing. But I think including your pronouns is definitely um, acceptable. Yeah, I'm I would agree yeah. with that. I, I, I think uh it's really a personal preference too. If you, if mm -hmm. you uh, would like to include your pronouns because you want people to refer to you in a specific way, absolutely put them on there. There is zero risk or absolutely nothing wrong with having them there. Um, and I think actually we're seeing it more and more of people including those. And, and truthfully, even as well as recruiters who do a lot of the first screens, we want to know. Uh, we want to yeah. make sure uh, we're calling... Uh, uh, using the right pronouns. Uh, and it's the same if if maybe you have a preferred first name rather than the one that was given to you, right, Julie, would you say? I mean, if yeah. you had, if you didn't want to be referred to as, uh, you know, I, I, my full name is Jonathan. I use John a lot, but I do typically put John as a preferred first name. So yeah. Um, Especially it's nice, like when I'm going through and looking through resumes to do phone screens, it is nice to see somebody's pronouns on their resume and what name they would like to be called. So then when I call them, I don't have to, I don't have to ask or um, like, you know, accidentally call somebody the wrong pronouns or something. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We'll move on to our next slide. This is next. I have a couple examples of, um, uh, a don't and then a do. I figured we'll do the don't first so we can end on the good one. Um, but this is an example of what not to do. As you can see on this resume, um, the the font is not professional. It's in like Comic Sans. It's also not on a full, it's not on a full sheet of paper. Um, the font's kind of small. It's hard to read. Um, and also he doesn't have anything like bolded. So it's hard to figure out which one is which, um, but definitely just not, not easy to read in this resume. So this is something you would want to avoid. Next, I'll move on to something that's a little bit more in the vein of something we would want to see. Not necessarily these exact categories. I think the categories of your resume are really going to depend on you personally. But just as far as formatting, what we really want to see is something with like your name at the top, a professional, easy to read font. The formatting is consistent throughout. On this one, they even included a little barcode to their LinkedIn page, which I think is a nice touch. Um, but as you can see on this one, all of the different experiences are dated. Everyone is in the things that they want you to see the most are in bolds. Um, and it's pretty easy to read. And I would add on this, Julia, we have a question too, I'll get to mm -hmm. in, in one second. Um, What's interesting here is this one actually is from 2016. So this person had, had I think, just graduated. Um, and so they put, it, because they just graduated, it's okay to put your education up front because that is going to be a bulk of your experience. And then if you notice under the skills, they've, they've utilized putting their key projects first because that's what their most recent experience was. Um, and also I would say you can flip this between key projects projects and experience, especially if your projects from college directly relate to the job. You want to highlight things front and center that directly re relate to the position you're applying for. Um, so this can be swapped here too. Um, but to Julia's point, it's very clear. They have bolded each section. Um, there isn't a ton of typing on here, but it's very easy to kind of read through. I would note too, I, they, they have their LinkedIn page uh, QR code up there. Um, 
that again is personal preference to me. I always just look for it typed out link below your email address and phone number on top uh, because we're looking at these from a computer where we're clicking to your LinkedIn profile. I'm not looking at this from my cell phone or I'm going to screenshot or scan the QR code uh, on my cell phone. I'm gonna click it in our uh, applicant tracking system online. Uh, so much easier to have it just the link put in, uh, usually right under the way this person has their name, address, email address, phone number, exactly how I think it looks the best. And then the LinkedIn right under that. Um, Question, another question, uh, Julia, is there a specific font employers look for and should my resume be in all black and white or can I include color? Uh, another question that just came in. Um, I'm happy, I mean, I, the, as yeah, Julia I mentioned before, the fonts, this, it's just more the standard ones. When you look at the don't resume, believe it or not, I know when you're typing it out, it looks kind of fun and fancy, but it does make it more difficult to read when we're staring at the computer screen, as opposed to when you do, uh, it's, I think the, the general ones are Times New Roman, Arial, Calib Calibri, I think is another yeah. one. Um, I would say Times New Roman is always a safe always, font. Yeah always yeah. a safe font that you can use that's professional yeah. um so if you're wondering what specific font to use just use times new roman yeah and uh to the second part of that question should it always be in black and white uh or if not color i would say the majority of the time i just want to see black and white however there are other companies and even here but companies i've worked for if we're hiring a graphic design uh, person or uh, you know something that deals in the arts of some sense. I've seen some very unique resumes put out there. And to be honest with you, that kind of helps in that sense. But I think when you're going for most, most positions, I think you just keep it black and white. And uh, it, again, it makes it easier. And a lot of the times you'll find too, and, and some of you may have seen this if you're actively out there applying for jobs, not every uh, applicant tracking system uh, puts the resume into the system in the best format. So uh, color sometimes will throw that off if you just keep it uh, normal like that. Um, I know we're going to probably get to this, Julia, but I'll ask the question because it's here so we don't miss any. Mm -hmm. Should I put achievements on my resume, like where you have honors and awards listed, and what kinds of achievements are beneficial uh, to list there? uh publications award certification so this might lead us into the next slide anyway i here. think this will lead us perfectly into this next slide of what to include on your resume um and this is like the dues like what you should include um the first thing um is always to put your most relevant experiences at the top of your resume so any any job that you worked in the past that has relevant experience to the job you're applying for that is the most important thing to put front and center on your resume um it's you also can also want to include along with your most relevant experiences you want to include your most relevant skills and especially if you're applying for more like technology based um positions you definitely want to write out your skills and you can write out um the proficiency and the skills especially with more technical technological resumes uh, with more technical skills um, and then also another thing you definitely want to include, and I think this kind of goes along with the question that um, someone was asking, is you want to include any leadership positions that you've been in the, in the past, um, awards or achievements. I definitely think if you feel as if they're relevant, you can include them. And especially if you're a new grad, um, which I know a lot of times like new grads, you're coming out of college or even high school and maybe you don't have as maybe you don't have that much experience to put on your resume not enough to fill up the whole page and that's when you can definitely put in any relevant coursework that you did relevant projects that you did um achievements that per, that would be relevant to the field that you're looking for a job in so I don't think putting, I don't, you can add into this, John, but I definitely think putting like achievements or leadership positions, as long as they're relevant to the 
type of and not taking away from other relevant experience on your resume, I think they're fine to include. Yeah, I would agree with that. Again, it's it's all based off of what uh, what role you're applying for and what those achievements are. Um, and and I think we kind of know, and and we, we go more into this too over the high school stuff. I think a little bit. Um, but if you've been in the working world and had either graduated high school or college 20, 30 years ago, some of the awards you won in high school and college are probably no longer relevant. So if, if you're trying to manage space, and, and I think it goes back, I hate to keep moving back and forth between slides here, but if you also have 20 or 30 years of experience, your resume is also not gonna be one page. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's okay. I think that the key is on the first page to have everything as relevant to the job as, as possible. But, uh, yeah, I think publications, I think, uh, uh, awards that are related to any employment or a job that you've had certificates, if they're relevant to what you're posting for. And there are a lot of jobs that require specific certifications. And if you have that, uh, you should absolutely, uh, put those on there. And we can go into a couple of don't what things to definitely not include on your resume, because I think there is so many different types of things you can include on your resume that oftentimes it can feel overwhelming. So here's a few things to definitely not include. Um, the first one is um, details of your hobbies and interests. Oftentimes it is okay to add a small section at the bottom if you wanted to put a couple of your hobbies and interests that you like to do for like a little bit more of a personal touch on your resume, that's fine. But definitely don't take up valuable, valuable space on your resume detailing your hobbies and interests because at the end of the day, that's not something that the employer is looking to for when they're hiring you. They might be interested in that once they hire you to get you to know you as a person, but as far as the hiring process, definitely don't de put in lots of details about your hobbies and interests. Um, the next is including a relevant coursework or jobs. Um, I know for me, I was a server back in high school and now that I'm a few years into the working world, maybe that's not something that I would include on my resume anymore because it's not relevant to the types of jobs that I'm applying for in HR. So um, definitely you don't need to include anything that's completely irrelevant to your job search or not going to add to you as a good candidate, looking as a good candidate on your resume. And then the last thing to definitely not include on your resume is references. Um, Unless there was specific instructions to include references in some sort of application that you're implying, applying for, you definitely don't need to include them on your resume. Um, it's not something that generally needs to be included on your resume. And most of the time in the process of applying, the reference check is at a later stage than when you're going to be giving your than when you're going to be submitting your resume. So you can hold off on that for now. Two questions, Julia. One, we, I think we've kind of answered them, but we, mm -hmm. I want to dive in a little bit. One person did ask, uh, I've seen some people include personal interests on the resume, sometimes under the skills section, hiking, running, or painting. Obviously, you covered that. I, I tend to leave those off. Or you put them down at the bottom of yeah. personal interests. I would the say only... at the bottom if you're going to include them. Yeah, and the only time it may be okay to to put a little bit more info in that, again, if it's a uh, years ago, for example, I worked for a company called Fitbit that built the health, the trackers on your wrist when they were popular, and uh, you know a lot of people who were marathon runners or ma ran groups of running groups, et cetera put that on there. And we like to see that because you wanted to be a part of that, that kind of community. So if it has a direct relation to what the company is doing, but I think the overall message probably here, both Julie and I say, it has to relate to the job you're applying for the company itself. Um, 
So I think we've covered that one. The next question is, at what point should I exclude certain positions? And this might be a good one for you to answer, Julia. I'm grad graduating college soon, and some of my peers started leaving off high school experience or non-industry experience. If my relevant experience doesn't fill the whole page, do I include experience that isn't relevant? I have a little bit of a take on that, but but want to get your thoughts on that one as well. I mean... I can relate to this because I graduated college a year and a half ago and also did not have enough relevant experience to fill out my whole resume. So I definitely understand that type of situation. I know for me, I opted instead of putting like all of my high school jobs or like high school information, I opted to put on like relevant coursework or projects that I had done or volunteering opportunities I had done that related to the types of things I was looking for instead of putting my high school information on there because I kind of felt like once I had graduated college like your resume should really reflect kind of like what you did in college and what you're doing and what you're looking to do rather than the things that you did in high school um so I would say I would say opt to add like like think of like a class you took in college where you did like a really great group project where you did like lots of great things in it and put that on your resume because that is like working on a group project is probably going to be better than babysitting in high school. Anything to add, John? I would, I yes, I would agree with that. I think that's a great, I was going to say a similar thing of, <clears throat> You don't need your entire high school career if you work through high school. Um, and, and sometimes if if it's, again, if it is relevant in some sense, um, uh, but I think that in, especially coming out of college, if you can include projects you've done, coursework that or classes even that you've taken and what you learned in that class, I think can be somewhat beneficial. Um, and, and that should be, fill up close to a page, um, you know, it's, I think that kind of gets more into maybe the interview stage of, it never hurts to say, hey, I, I've had a job since I was 14 years old. I've, I've always worked. I made my way through college, et cetera. Shows a lot of perseverance and, and et cetera. So uh, I think that's things you can certainly talk about, um, but recruiters and whether they're internal or working for an agency, recruiters are going to look at What's your experience that I can go to the hiring manager to say, this person looks like they have uh, uh, some good experience doing this, this, and this. I think we should interview them. And that that's really what we're looking for. Yeah, definitely. I, I know um, this is just something else I was thinking while you were talking, John, to another idea for something you could add. I know um, when I was in college, like people, any any like club where anyone was on like the e-board we would mm. always include that mm -hmm. any leadership positions in any clubs you had I was I was like an orientation leader I included that anything that I did like extracurricularly in college where you held like some sort of leadership position definitely include that as well mm -hmm. um okay let's go to our next one this um Last for resumes, we'll talk about what to actually write on your resume, how to write the bullets on your resume. So this, now we have, we've talked about the for, how to format it, we've talked about what to include, and now you're actually trying to write the bullets of each of the sections of your resume, and you're like, I have no idea what to write. I don't know how to make myself look better, um, but... The first thing I, the first piece of advice I have to share is to make your descriptions for your experiences um, specific and also bulleted. You don't want to be writing long paragraphs about each of the positions you had. You definitely want them to be in concise bullets. And um, one method, you could use a different method too, but I think one method that's really helpful in writing these these bullets is the star method. So there's like four aspects to a bullet that you can write about a duty you did at your job. Um, first, you wanna describe the context of the situation. So situation S, 
T is task. So you want to explain the task or project and any challenges or expectations that you had. A is action. So you want to go through the actions you took to complete your goals. And this is expressed through an action verb. And then R is results. And this is the outcome of your efforts. And you want to express this through quantitative data. So you always want to be saying like, how how many customers you served or or you improve 10% or you always want to be quantifying the work that you do. Um, so an example of this is um, wrote. So that's the action. Weekly blogs for the company website. That's describing the situation. To improve top of the funnel marketing efforts. That's the task. And then leading to a 10% increase in leads. And that would be the result using quantitative data. So just, oh, sorry. So some additional tips and we'll go over um, another example of another example of a description as well, if that didn't make sense to you. Um, but just some other tips is you don't always need to use every single part of the STAR method for every single bullet that could leave your bullets like a little overstuffed or like fluffy. Um, and then again, you want to avoid hanging bullets. So always using complete sentences. Um, you want to use the entire page. You want to update your resume regularly. Put your most relevant experiences first. And again, proofread. And then another thing I included on this slide was just like a list of some good verbs to use in your resume. Because a lot of times I think when you're thinking about the things you did, you're like, oh, I did this, like I did that. But really, if you can try to think of like really good action verbs, like advised, analyzed, managed, oversaw, planned, produced, those types of, and using a different one in each of your sections could really make your resume stand out and really allow you to like really describe well what you did at your previous job. I would add uh, one thing at least as well, and it goes back to almost, uh, for, well, it works for both sides. If you've been working for a while and for college folks, but a lot of the times we see on resumes, um, a bullet point that could be worked on a team that did this, and this is what the team built. But what you really need to dig out of that is what your role on the team was and the specific responsibilities that you had and what you accomplished from that. It, 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 the bullet point could be worked on a team that did this, but in then it's a follow-up of, I did this in this group. I did, this is the things that I accomplished. Um, almost like the example, um, there could have been an entire marketing team that was doing weekly blogs, but this specific person wrote the blogs, um, et cetera. So I think that's uh, one thing to keep in mind as you're, writing out kind of what you worked on. Um, and the other thing, and I saw this actually recently, um, and it's, it's, it's hard to do, especially if you're in a job that you love and, you know, not planning to leave, but um, updating your resume every three months, I would say is, is probably the maximum amount of time you want to go before updating your resume again. And mostly it's because when you're working, you're doing a thousand things every day and you don't want to forget some of the cool things or some of the things that you've done that were pretty significant. Um, so it never hurts to take a look at it every month or two, uh, definitely every three months, even if in, you're in a job that you don't think you're going to be leaving soon. It's just to remind you of all the things you've been working on. Um, plus, to be honest with you, it helps in performance reviews when you are working, because then you can sort of run through and say, oh, yeah, well, I did this and this and this over the last two or three months um, to your manager or supervisor, whoever that is. Um, and then one quick thing that I just want to mention again, I'm sorry for, for moving back and forth between oh, slides. No you don't have to go back to a slide, but more around references, because Julia brought up a good point of... A, you should never list references on your resume, but B, if you're applying to a job and they ask you to provide references with contact information in the application, you are 100% okay to write in the text box, 
references provided after interview or references to be provided later, we do not count that against any, I, I would never ask for references up front before I've even had a chance to interview somebody or talk to somebody. But if you see that on an application, uh, because I've seen people uh, you know, that all of a sudden their references are getting called, they haven't had one interview and it could be people you currently work with. And uh, uh, so just a quick little tidbit there. If, if somebody's asking you for references and contact information, you never have to list out the, those people's uh, the, those those people's information. Um, so just sorry, just something I thought about there, but the, it's a good tip. Yeah. Yeah, but um, just to wrap up this slide, um, and reiterate what John was saying, remember that you are the star of your resume. So you want to be writing about the great things that you do for other people. So, and don't be afraid to, um, don't be afraid to like put in, put in great things that you've done. Like, don't be afraid to like brag about yourself a little bit in your resume. But we'll move over to the don'ts on what to write. So, um, the first thing is don't rely on AI or ChatGPT to make your descriptions or your resume in general. Because a lot of times, especially in applicant tracking systems, I'm they're they're already using AI to go over the to go over the resume. So a lot of times if you have an AI generated resume, it's not going to the applicant tracking systems are not going to pick up on the correct things to get your resume through to the next round. And then also just your resume should be something that is about you and you're really thinking about and putting um, effort into. So, and no AI or like Chappie GBT is going to be able to capture what you could capture about yourself. So um, don't use AI to make your resume. And then the next is don't include objective statements in your resume. Um, like I said before, you should be trying to make yourself look good on your resume, but you shouldn't be making statements that are like, I am great at my job or <laughs> um, things like that. Like you don't want to be making statements that someone could say, oh, well, in my opinion, that's not true. You want to be writing the things that you did at your job and things like that and like experiences you had and things you worked on or skills that you have, but you don't want to be making objective statements about how you did your job or things like that. Um, and the next one is don't write out long paragraphs describing each of your experiences. You really want to be using bullet points and you want to make them pretty concise. They don't, you don't want them to be too long um, because when you write out long paragraphs and it's just a big block of text, employers like really don't want to read that. So it's a lot less likely for somebody to actually read through your whole resume and skim through it if it's in paragraph format. And then we can move on to, um, this is also just a do and a don't for examples for writing your description. Um, so as you can see in the do section, we have, um, I was working at XYZ Human Resources Department and Waltham as the front office assistant. And you can see I put the dates of my employment as well. Um, and then I have three bullets for the things that I did, which is a pretty standard amount. Um, I have, I directed and communicated with desk, guests daily in the office. I delegated and interpreted information from phone calls to the correct recipients through the office, managed and organized thousands of confidential files for the department. And I, or four bullets actually, and assisted human resources personnel with special projects relating to the company, communications and recruitment. So after looking at that first one, we can do, I changed it to something that I wouldn't want to see on a resume, which is, it's just one paragraph. It doesn't have really good verbs in it. Um, and it's pretty much just like a run on. And there's, a, there's definitely an objective statement in there as well. Um, but like, I said hello to people in the office and answered the phones. I did filing and helped with projects. Sometimes I helped with projects for recruiters and sometimes with benefits. I was a great help. So as you can see, 
definitely the first the first option is the better option because you're writing out in the individual bullets it's not in a paragraph you're not making objective statements and you're most of these were also made using the star method as well yes i would uh agree with this and there's a question that comes in that i'll, I'll ask here in a second but mm -hmm. um the there's always if you go online and you can look and see on average recruiters look at a resume for six to eight seconds before they determine whether you're a fit for the role or not. And when a recruiter is looking at that, and I know a lot of us want to say we do look at it longer and it's very position dependent because there are some positions we get hundreds upon hundreds of resumes and others we don't, but you just look through these two examples and see how much easier it is to get through exactly what this person did in one or two seconds rather than having to read an entire uh, entire paragraph. Um, question that came in, Julia, what if we don't put the date uh, of the, um, the position because of inconsistent or some gaps? Um, what do you think about how to best handle that in terms of not putting dates on the on the resume? I have a view that I can go to. If I you think want me to. maybe I think maybe you share first, John. So I would always put dates on a resume. I'll be very honest with you, uh, regardless of gaps or not. Um, I don't look at gaps. If if there is a gap, and and even on, for example, my own resume, I was with a company for less than a year and then was laid off due to a layoff. And I actually put after the company laid off due to acquisition or something like that. Um, I have also seen and interviewed and hired people who have, um, for example, a mom who has stayed home with her, with her children for a few years and then gone back to work. And in that gap, there is just a quick explanation. I've seen that people who have gone on medical leave uh, was, uh, you know, out due to medical leave for this year. And it has the dates of that year. So we can quickly say because the first question a recruiter will ask you if if you do get an interview with them is, please explain to me this gap. Um, and we'll talk about it still. I never rule people out because of that. Uh, but I also like to see when they acknowledge it that, hey, was only here for three months, um, you know, and, and maybe this was the reason. Without, I will say this, it's it's without talking uh, bad about your past employer of, this company was terrible. I got laid off. Like, don't put that in. But uh, there is nothing against saying you were laid off. We've all gone through the past three years of COVID. Uh, companies have gone through this, and and everybody has been hit one point or another. Even if it's before that, I would always say honesty is the best way to 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 just be forthright and just. And then we'll get into cover letters in a minute. But then that's an area where you can sort of talk about it in a cover letter too. You'll notice, you know, don't shy away from it. You'll notice a gap in my resume or a short employment here. This was the reasoning why. Yeah, I, I think that being forthright and definitely even if I think it would definitely come off better to an employer to include dates on your resume and explain the gap rather than not including them and trying to like, hide it a little because at the end of the day like if we don't see dates on a resume we'll probably suspect that there was um some sort of gap in employment or something so definitely i would say make it clear and just explain yourself because everybody's a human being so and everybody has things happen in their life um, and there are the last thing I'll say about it is and not at Fenway Health, but there are a lot of companies that also do employment background checks and they verify the dates that you worked at certain employees. So yeah. employers, you never wanted to come up at the end of the process uh, in some sort of check like that. Um, so that's that's our view. on Employers it. can also see all the W-2s that you've had on file in the past, usually. So um. Next, we'll move on to cover letters, some do's and don'ts. This section will be a little shorter, but um, first, I just wanted to go over like what 
is a cover letter. And a cover letter is basically a letter that you write to the hiring manager to express your interest in a specific position and also explain why you think you specifically would be a good fit for that position. And a lot of more mission-based companies and things like that, I know at Fenway Health, we ask for a cover letter for pretty much every single position that you apply for. Mm -hmm. So some do's for your cover letters. Um, when you go to write your cover letter, do include information from the job description or website. So before you go to write your cover letter, the first thing that you should do is go on to the employer's website or go back to the job description and you should look at the things that they're looking for specifically. So maybe they say, we want someone who is an amazing communicator. We need someone who's a really clear communicator. That's your cue. You should talk about your communication skills in your cover letter. So definitely going on seeing what they're looking for and then so you can pitch yourself to be what they're looking for. Um, the next thing is making it personalized. Like I said, you should be, if you know the name of the hiring manager, you should say, dear John, dear Julia, or dear hiring, hiring manager in this department. Um, and you should also make sure you're addressing that company specifically in the letter. You should be talking specifically about things that are on their website. This kind of goes hand in hand with like doing your research before so it doesn't just seem like a generic cover letter that you submitted to every single company that you applied for. Um, the next is explain why, explain why you wanna work for the company, why you think you would be a great fit for that specific position and why you should get the job. Um, this is more, the resume, no objective statements on the resume, but in your cover letter, this is where you're kind of trying to say like why you think you're a good fit and you can put objective statements in there. Um, and the last is again, proofread, proofread, proofread your cover letter. You don't want to put the wrong company in your cover letter. That has definitely happened, I feel like to a lot of people before. And I, that happens all the time when I'm looking at them, it'll be like, Dear Cambridge Health Alliance manager. And I'm like, oh no. But um, definitely proofread. And then a couple don'ts for your cover for your cover letters is don't attach your resume instead of your cover letter in the cover letter spot. That is something that we see all the time when we ask for cover letters because especially if the cover letter is mandatory to submit the application, a lot of times people will just put their resume in that spot. And that kind of just shows to us that maybe this applicant didn't really read the directions or they didn't take the time to actually like write us a personal personalized cover letter. Um, and then don't use the same, like I said before, don't use the same generic cover letter for every position. A lot of times, yeah, you can keep some of the core, some of the core things of your cover letter because a lot of the positions you're applying to have like similar things that they're looking for, but definitely try to make it personalized to each position that you're applying for. Yeah, and I would just say, Julia, to your exact point, and even to speaking as Fenway Health, we are such a mission-driven company. And the reason we ask people for a cover letter is because we want to see that you feel the same way. Uh, we want to hire people who are mission driven. And that comes out in a cover letter. It's hard. It, we want to see what you've done in your resume. We want to know why you want to work at Fenway Health in your cover letter. And that's why we ask for it. Uh, and everybody has a different reason. And that's that's what we love about it. But that's why we're asking. So really, that's your chance to sort of put some personal stuff in there, put whatever you're comfortable and, and your real reasoning for wanting to join the company. Yeah. And this is just like a very generic example. I would say, like I said, every cover letter is going to be different. So don't take, take this example with a grain of salt because you would probably never write a cover letter like this for yourself, but just as far as like formatting. So every cover letter should have, a heading at the top, it is like a letter, so you should be dating it like a letter. Um, it should have the letter, it should have the salutation, so 
dear John, dear hiring manager, dear recruiter, um, when in doubt, you can always put dear hiring manager. That's that's pretty standard if you don't know who to address it to. Um, the next should be an introduction about yourself. You should say like, like this one says, please accept this as an expression of my interest for the home health aid position. So you should say like, I'm expressing my interest for this specific position. And then you should introduce your introduce yourself with some of your like best skills. So like this person said that they're highly organized and compassionate. Um, and so definitely introduce yourself in that first paragraph, say some of your strengths, and then um, you should have a body paragraph, maybe even two body paragraphs, depending on what you what you want to write. Just know that don't make it too long because again, recruiters are looking at this. They're skimming for um, relevant information usually. So definitely put this is where you put why you want to work for them, what attributes that you have that they you think they would value, things like that, and then. Um, you should have a closing paragraph of just saying, um, you please take the time to v review my resume, my information is below, and then you should end it with um, just like a thank you, and then you should sign off the letter as well. Anything to add to that, John? No, I mean, I would agree. This is, I guess, as I just mentioned and, and Julia mentioned, this is your time to really show why you're interested and what your experience can bring to the table. And a lot of the times, and, and this happens a lot too, is if we're looking at a resume that doesn't seem to quite match everything we're looking for in that job, I go to the cover letter, and I know Julie does this too, to kind of see, oh, why did this person apply to this job? Because I can't see everything that that we've seen in all the other resumes. And sometimes that can make or break whether you get the interview. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's okay to acknowledge it too. I know I don't have this and this and this that I see in the job description, but I'm applying because of my experience here and my love for this and my interest in doing this. Um, it, it really can make a difference. Yeah, I know when I'm screening applications for doing phone screens a lot of the time if there's somebody who's like right on the cusp with experience wise like maybe they have like just the or just below the minimum amount or just the minimum amount a lot of times we're looking at their cover letter and if they're in I know at Fenway Health if they seem to be really mission driven and aligning with us in the cover letter I'll push them through, but if they seem like they haven't read the website or maybe they're not aligned with us in the cover letter, then I'm not going to push them through. So a lot of times having a good cover letter can be that thing that can make or break you for getting the interview. And then I think that concludes us with our presentation. And if anybody has any other questions, um, please feel free to put them in, in the Q&A box. I see a question, a couple of questions coming in. Uh, I don't know if you see these two, Julia. Do hire managers like seeing a creative resume format if I'm playing a creative field? I, it, to an extent, yes. And I, I sort of mentioned this before. Yeah. It, again, make sure it's still easy to read. Um, yeah. But it's always nice to create. And I think, too, uh, in almost every job application for a creative role will probably ask for your portfolio. Um, but even if it doesn't include those links and actually uh, for a lot of creative roles I've recruited for in the past, just below your LinkedIn profile link at the top of your resume and your contact information, put a link to your portfolio um, uh, right in there. So it's easy for recruiters and or hiring managers to, uh, to click on and then look through that stuff. Yeah. Um, there's also so much information on the internet. Like when I was doing research to make this presentation specifically, I saw so much information about um, creative, um, creating 
creative resumes. I didn't include that much in this presentation, but I definitely know it's out there. And like, if you just Google it and then you like use a trusted source, like don't use like a random website, like use like <laughs> Forbes or something that something that's credible, but there's a lot of information about things like that. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, again, just to sort of wrap up everything as, as Julie was saying, um, and, and because I know there's been, you know, questions around it and people ask us all the time, uh, you know, I just want to reiterate any resumes are meant to be aligned with what the job you're applying to. So if you're in IT and you uh, are applying to a sales role because you want to switch careers, try to make your bullet points under each job you've had be as relatable to the job you're applying for. So if there's any sales related responsibilities you had in your job as an IT professional, make sure those are on there uh, and really make those stand out in, in a cover letter as well. Um, and again, I think that <clears throat> under if you go down the resume, we're talking one page to two page, it's, it very much depends on how much experience you have. Um, I've been out of, I've been in the working world for a long time. I have not included my high school for uh, a really long time on my resume. Um, I don't even include my GPA anymore, to be honest with you, because it really shouldn't matter if I've been working in the working world for 20 plus years. Uh, I think I've, I've, I've earned it to know what I'm doing now. So I think that um, that is just things to consider as you're looking overall. And, and I'll end lastly with, Julia mentioned this multiple times, but please, please proofread um, your resume and your cover letter. We know we know people use templates for cover letters. I can't tell you how many cover letters I've seen that say, I am interested in this position at parentheses company name. And like, you have to go in and actually fill out the, uh, the, the, the cover letters there. Uh, but I've also had hiring managers who won't interview people because they have so many spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes on their resumes. Now, I don't think that should always discourage people. It doesn't necessarily to me, A, because I'm a terrible speller uh, and and I, English was not my my best class, but, uh, um, but it's so easy now. Put it in Word. Uh, it does, it highlights them all and just go through and proofread. And that's, that's, that's key. And a couple of these other questions, just before we wrap up, what should you do if your if your experiences don't align with the types of positions you're working for? You don't have any relevant experience. Um, I would say, like we said, that's something like I know I had people who are doing a career change, that's something you can explain in your cover letter. Mm -hmm. I know that recently um, for a direct client services job, we interviewed someone who only had teaching experience on their resume. Um, obviously, um, they should have included that teaching experience because that was the only experience they had. It wasn't direct relevant experience to the type of position that um, they were applying for, but um, definitely, we ended up we ended up since they were doing a career change like if you're if you don't have that relevant experience include it and then explain in the cover letter mm -hmm. that you're making a career change and that's why and then i think you spoke to including including yeah, your high, high school. school under your education section yeah. i think for me, it would still be appropriate because I've only been working for a few years, but for somebody who's been working as like for you, John, that yeah. really wouldn't make any yeah. sense. No. That's about it, I think. And I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you both, Julia and John, so much for joining us. Uh, I also want to thank the attendees for signing on today. Uh, just as another reminder, our LGBT LGBTQ job fair is uh, this upcoming Monday. Uh, 3 to 6 p.m. at Northeastern University. You can find more details about that on our website or on our social media. Um, this recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you signed on late or uh, wanted to go back and review any of the material uh, that will be available to you on our YouTube channel, just search up MALGBTCC on YouTube. Uh, that should be going up hopefully by midday tomorrow. 
Uh, if you have any other questions at all about the job fair, uh, please feel free to email me. I'm going to put my email in the chat right now, and then I will leave the Zoom open for a minute so that you can copy paste that. Um, and once again, I want to thank Julia and John for representing Fenway Health and uh, giving us so much great information today. Thank Our you pleasure. So much, Michael. We'll see everybody next Monday. Yeah, we'll see everybody fair. on Monday. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. bye.